بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and we continue in the books that deal with the food what is specifically forbidden to eat and we talked last time about general things that are permissible to eat and we limit now the things that we're not supposed to eat which is much easier than saying what are we allowed to eat the things that we are allowed to eat are so many with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, that are beyond our ability to calculate. Because everything that Allah has created is halal to us. And what is haram is very limited. So when a non-Muslim asks you, what can Muslim eat? The easiest answer would be everything except what Allah has prohibited. That's it. But if you're going to mention just the fruits, there are hundreds of them, and it would take you ages. So when we come to speak about what Allah has specifically prohibited, Azza wa Jal, we will find a verse in chapter 5, verse number 3, where Allah Azza wa Jal mentions to us in details some of the things that are prohibited for us to eat. Allah says, prohibited to you are dead animals, blood, the flesh of swine, and that which has been dedicated to other than Allah. And those animals killed by strangling or by a violent blow or by a headlong fall or by the gorging of horns and those from which a wild animal has eaten except what you are able to slaughter before its death and those which are sacrificed on stone altars. So these are 10 types of food that Allah has prohibited for us Muslims to consume. So the first one is the dead animals, the carrion. And this refers to any animal that has died without us Muslims slaughtering it. Of course, the people of the book take the ruling of our slaughtering as well. Or without it being hunted, if it's a game. So any animal you would find dead if it's not slaughtered by the people of the book or a Muslim and if it is not hunted as a game in this case it is a dead animal carrion that is not permissible for us to consume and this is the general rule and trend except for two types and that is seafood and the locust so the prophet himself said to us it was made prohibited for it was made permissible for us two types of dead and two types of blood so the dead he mentioned to us seafood and the locust 
we know that hunt uh, that fishing is permissible and that is when we throw our nets when we throw our uh, uh, hooks and we fish a fish there's no problem in that the problem is what if the fish was floating on the sea or it's on the shores and it's dead by itself the hadith clearly indicates that this is halal for us the second type is the blood and what is meant by the blood this refers to spilled blood blood that comes out of an animal Allah Azza wa says in the Quran I do not find anything forbidden to eat unless it be carrion or blood poured forth and lots of the people may know and may not know that there are people there are nations there are tribes such in Mongolia and, and, and elsewhere where they slaughtered the goat or the ram or the any animal they want to eat and they collect the blood in a vessel and they either cook it or drink it or do whatever they want with it this is totally haram it's najis it's prohibited in islam and this of course excludes two things as mentioned in the hadith earlier and that is the liver and the spleen these two are internal organs of an animal yet they consist entirely of blood nevertheless the prophet said that these are halal for us to consume now a lot of the muslims get confused sometimes so when they eat steak and they cut it they find that there is light blood coming out of it and they can see traces on their plates so they ask is does this render our food haram that says no what is haram it was what gushes from the slaughtered animal and this is najis what remains in the veins what remains in the meat itself when it's cooked when it's cut and comes out this does not impact it this does not affect it it is pure and it is halal to consume number three the flesh of swine and anything that is from a swine is haram whether it is its flesh its milk and the majority of scholars would consider it to be haram as well to use its lard and other things because this is part of the meat itself so a swine a pig a pork all of this is haram and it is prohibited for the muslims to consume reasons many scientists have proven that it is one of the most dangerous meat to consume and there are so many illnesses in it as Muslims we don't even have to look into such evidences because it's simply mentioned in the Quran and the Prophet has mentioned it alayhi as salatu was salam number four that which has been dedicated to other than Allah so if an animal was dedicated to other than Allah it was slaughtered for Jesus Christ it was slaughtered for Prophet Muhammad it was slaughtered for the jinn there are practices that people may do without 
noticing maybe they do but it's in the back of their minds that is when people start to build a building and they dig down an earth to set the foundation while setting the foundation a lot of the laymen come and slaughter a sheep and they put the blood of the slaughtered sheep on the pillars of these foundations not knowing that this act by itself is a sacrifice for the jinn the people do this so that the jinn would not infest not haunt this house not harm the people in the, who are to live in this house and all of this is major shirk because slaughtering can only be to allah Azzawajal, for the sake of allah so if someone says that i'm slaughtering for the sake of the prophet muhammad والسلام, and he says bismi muhammad or for the sake of jesus christ peace be upon him all of this is shirk this particular animal is dead meat we cannot eat it we cannot use it we have to throw it uh, uh, in the dustbin or better more we can feed it to the dogs and to the beasts but not suitable for human uh, consumption number five the animal that has been strangled and this is called al munkhaniqa so if an animal dies through being suffocated strangled not able to breathe then this becomes a dead animal dead meat it's haram to eat and in some nations they use this form to kill an animal i know uh, uh, of some of the non-muslims in i think korea or in the philippines when we had a lot of them working here in saudi arabia we had a lot of stray dogs and all of a sudden no, no dogs at all in our streets which was good but then we discovered that they consume it they eat it and they consider it as a delicacy and what they do is they catch the dog they tie a string of metal in one pole and then they bring the dog and they tie it around its neck and then they pull as strong as they can so it snaps i think maybe the neck and at the same time it strangles the animal and then they can feast on it so this is of course done by non-muslims because we don't eat dogs to begin with it's haram for Muslims to, de to eat dogs. But at the same time, this way of killing the animal, if it's a halal animal, it makes it haram. If you place a bag over the head of an animal until it dies and suffocates, this is considered to be al munkhaniqa Number six, I think, is by violent blow or beaten to death and this is known as al mawquza and this type of killing is found nowadays in butcher houses around the world so when they get a big animal such as a cow or a bull they would strike it on the head on a specific area with a hammer and this would kill the animal and then afterwards they cut it they slaughter it this is known as al mawquda and it is haram for muslims to consume and the, after that an animal that was killed by a fall and this is known as al mutaraddiya so if an animal fell off a cliff and it died then this becomes haram for us to eat because it died by itself 
by such a fall or by a blow or by suffocation it was not slaughtered so this is called al mutaraddiyah and this is haram for us to eat then an animal gorged gored to death by another animal and dies and this is called an so if two rams started a fight over a female during the mating season and one of them is severely injured we cannot eat from it unless it is still alive and we manage to slaughter it mentioning the name of Allah before it dies if it's dead then it's dead we cannot touch it uh, uh, consume it or eat it after that we have an animal which a wild animal has eaten or savaged by a beast of prey so we are at the wild we see a herd of zebras and then we see one wild cat a lion a leopard attacking it consuming some of it or just killing it and running away when it saw us can we eat this zebra the answer is no this is prohibited because it was not slaughtered unless of course if we come and find that there is life in it still then we can slaughter it and we can eat it and this is mentioned in the quran وَمَا أَكَلَ السَّبُورَ and i think finally or the number 10 animals which are sacrificed on stone altars so what's the difference between this and number four which is animals that has been dedicated to other than allah it seems to me that animals dedicated to other than allah can be slaughtered anywhere by mentioning other than allah's name so if you say in the name of freedom in the name of solidarity i slaughtered this sheep in the name of unity of our country in the name of jesus christ in the name of muhammad in the name of so and so this becomes dead meat but animals that are slaughtered as a form of sacrifice or at stone altars even if you mention the name of allah azawajal, it becomes haram because the area itself is where people offer their sacrifice to such gods and being there with them and doing their action renders your meat that you had slaughtered of this animal haram as well in Sahih Imam Muslim a man came to the Prophet and he said oh Prophet of Allah I vowed I made a pledge to slaughter a camel in the area known as Buwana. So the Prophet asked him some two questions. So the Prophet said to him, Is there any idol that is being worshipped? The man said, No. The significance of such a question is that if there is an idol, if you slaughter there, the vast majority would only think that you are slaughtering for their idol and hence this is haram so this is the difference that seems to me and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best so this is type number one of the things that Allah has prohibited upon us type number two as per the um, the book food or drink that are harmful these are haram so you cannot consume poison you cannot consume wine 
or any type of intoxicants or narcotic drugs because Allah says in the Quran do not with your own hands throw yourselves in ruin and Allah also says do not kill yourselves so killing yourself harming yourself is prohibited in Islam there isn't any such thing as I'm free I can do whatever I want no you're not you can't if you want to commit suicide it's your body but you are not entitled or permitted to do so in this life we'll throw you in, in jail in the hereafter you'll go to hell so there isn't anything as such I'm free in other countries their ceiling of freedom is pretty high but your freedom ends when it intrudes and trespasses on my own freedom so you want to take off your clothes be my guest do that in the vicinity of your own home if you do it in public you are intruding and transgressing and trespassing over my own freedom because I'm free not to see such heinous sceneries so you cannot harm yourself by consuming such haram substances number three it's forbidden to eat any part cut from a living animal so yes we have halal animals such as sheep cows and camels if someone does not slaughter these animals rather he amputates a part of it saying bismillah does it become halal that organ that he has amputated the answer is no and this is done to some animals like sheep for example when they have big tails with lots of um, fat in it so they cut it off this is haram the prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, whatever is cut off when the animal is alive is meita dead meat is forbidden so this is torturing the animal without any justifiable reason and at the same time it is haram for us to consume that part number four among the things that are prohibited for us as Muslims are predators such as lions tigers leopards wolves Abu Talha al-Ansari may Allah be pleased with him said that the Prophet prohibited eating the flesh of any beast with canine teeth so any animal that has a teeth which attacks other animals with is prohibited for us to consume even if we slaughter or hunt with the exception of one particular animal and we will talk about that later on inshallah so foxes wolves lions leopards tigers all of these are prohibited for us dogs cats are prohibited for us to consume their meat and it's dead meat and it's nudges it's impure similarly number five birds which catch their prey with their claws so predator birds such as eagles falcons kites owls all of these are prohibited for us to hunt and to eat well actually hunting is okay but it's not for eating so you may hunt it to use it while alive 
in catching other prey, like in the case of eagles, maybe falcons. They're trained to be hunters, like hounds that go and fish. So in, in such cases, yeah, this can be accepted, but eating them is definitely out of the question. Number six, scavenger birds such as vultures, ravens, and crows, because they feed on what is unwholesome. And also they have claws of their own as well. Some of these were instructed, we are instructed by the Sharia laws to kill, such as the crows. And crows, some scholars said that this is only for a specific type of crows and others said, no, it's every type of crows. So some said the crows that are totally black with white lines around their neck, maybe, or feet, something. These are to be killed. And it seems that they should all be killed because the crows that are scavengers and eat dead meat, we see them in the streets where I come from, and sometimes they may attack people when they see something glittering or just for the sake of fun. And also the crows that feed only on vegetation, which we usually find in farms. And that's why we have scarecrows, where they erect something that would make the crows afraid of coming in. And these also destroy crops and destroy the hard work of farmers. So it seems that both should be killed and Allah knows best. Either way, they cannot be consumed. We cannot consume their meat. Number seven, any animal we are recommended to kill, such as snakes, scorpions, mice, and kite. The Prophet <clears throat> five harmful animals may be killed even in the haram. And he mentioned the crow, the kite, the scorpion, the mouse, and the predatory dog. So these animals, we are instructed in Sharia to kill them. Hence, we cannot eat them. So the rule is anything that we're ordered to kill, generally speaking, we cannot eat. And anything we are prohibited from killing we are also not allowed to eat, such as such as uh, uh, the frogs. And we will come to mention this in a while, inshallah, uh, Azza wa Jal. Number eight, domestic donkeys. So donkeys in the beginning of time of Islam, they were like goats and cows. We can slaughter them and we can eat them. This ruling was abrogated on the seventh year of Hijrah, known as Am Khaybar. And the Prophet there prohibited the consumption of domestic donkeys. Number nine, what is disgusting to eat, such as mice? Well, mice were ordered to kill. Snakes, snakes we are ordered to kill. Wasps and bees, bees we are prohibited to kill. Allah Azza wa Jal says he forbids them all that is foul. So this is an issue of taste. Some cultures might be okay, in some cultures it might be haram. So what counts is whether it's harmful or not. Some people consider, for example, um, eating the desert lizard disgusting. Our Prophet did not eat it, Isusam. Did this render it to be haram? The answer is no. So scholars mention that this type of 
prohibition is for things that are despicable, such as ants, um, such as uh, roaches, and we know that people in so claimed a region here or there because of eating bats or eating roaches and mice and other uh, um, horrible reptiles such as snakes this is why we've got the coronavirus and this is unproven yet but nevertheless Islam is a religion of purity and such animals such insects are not um, suitable for human consumption number 10 any animal that feeds mostly on impurities and this is known as al jalala so whether it is a camel an ox a sheep chicken or any other and ibn umar may allah be pleased with him used to confine such animals for three days before slaughtering so if an animal only eats impurities feces this is all what it eats this some scholars say are uh, 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 consider it to be haram to consume so we cannot slaughter it and if we slaughter it it's dead meat why because they say it its consumption is entirely over impurities other scholars say no we have to look whether the impurities affected and impacted that animal so the milk becomes impure the meat becomes uh, uh, stinking and disgusting that you cannot eat then it becomes haram but the vast majority of chicken would eat feces this is not their entire diet but it is included in their diet so it seems that only if the entire diet of such an animal was from impure filthy things and that it is affected and impacted uh, um, the color the milk the meat of such an animal which would render it to be haram and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best okay what about when there is no ruling given so we see a raccoon for example i don't know what raccoons eat we see um, chipmunks what is the ruling on such animals well if this animal does not fall under the the guidelines the general guidelines of the 10 types we've mentioned which are haram to consume such as being canines such as uh, being um, among the things we were ordered to kill or not to kill etc if it does not fall under these general guidelines the Quran says it is he who created for all for you all that is on earth it falls under the general guidance of it becoming halal so the default is it's halal abu darda may allah be pleased with him said that the prophet sallam, said whenever allah has permitted in his book whatever allah has permitted in his book is lawful and whatever he has prohibited is forbidden what he has not mentioned is left to you so accept from Allah what he has given you for Allah would not forget anything he then recited the verse that says never does your Lord forget anything and this is why it is an issue of dispute whether crocodiles and alligators are haram or not some scholars say it is haram because it has teeth i don't know if they, they can call it canine or not that attacks prey with and eats them 
others say no it is part of seafood and sea creatures and hence Sheikh Ibn Athimi says it's halal to consume because he sees that it is not clearly mentioned to be haram so it is part of what Allah has not mentioned and has forgiven us so Allah did not forget it we would accept what Allah has given us so this is one of the ways of looking at issues of dispute and Allah Azza wa knows best and uh, also um, it's mentioned that uncooked onions or garlic uh, that give bad breath are prohibited when a person is going to prayer so actually they're not prohibited they're halal all the way but if a person consumes it then going to the masjid for him would be prohibited because this would offend worshipers and it's also would offend the angels as we were told in uh, uh, the authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. We move on to animal slaughter. And Muslims are not allowed to eat anything. Everything has to be done through a procedure. So it's not any meat that we can eat. And this wraps up nicely. It's not any meat that we can eat. And the meat we can eat, it has to be processed in a specific way. It has to be slaughtered. And the one who slaughters it has to have specific characteristics. And the tool he uses must be also following the procedures so in islam it is governed and this is only when it comes to meat so any uh, uh, veg food you have no problem with that whether the person cooking it is a hindu or a sikh or a buddhist it's a veg food, no problem. You can eat it. So the one who plucks it from the tree is an atheist, no problem. It does not impact the food. The one who cooks meat also does not impact the food. So if the chef is a Buddhist or an atheist, agnostic without any religion if he's cooking halal meat his cooking is permissible what is not permissible is how you got this meat so was it slaughtered who was it slaughtered by how it was slaughtered etc so when we come to animal slaughter it has to be done in a specific fashion you cannot just slash the animal and make it bleed from all parts of bodies then you eat it this is dead meat carrion haram so these conditions are ways of us to consume an animal is one to slaughter it that is by cutting the throat and the jugular veins and this is done by the usual saying bismillah allahu akbar and you slaughter the neck of the animal number two is known in arabic Nahr and Nahr means the neck and the upper chest area this is called Nahr 
You can't see it because of the beard. Alhamdulillah. And this is usually done with camels. You know, camels have long necks. And then the necks, their neck is connected with the chest. This area here, a specific area, the way of slaughtering such animals is to tie its uh, front leg, one of them, and we say Bismillah Allah Akbar and we stab the animal in this area. This is for camels. Nahar. And this would make it die swiftly and quickly while most of the blood in the body would come out gushing like a fountain. And the third way that is halal to kill an animal is when the animal is either wild or it is uncontrollable. So we will talk about the wild animal when we speak about hunting. But for example, if we have a camel that is uncontrollable, attacking everyone. An animal on steroids, so strong, so powerful, hitting and running and biting. And well, there is a hadith which was reported by Rafi ibn Khadij. May Allah please with him, which he said, a camel went wild. But a man hit him with an arrow which restricted his movement. The Prophet said, Some of these domestic animals run wild like beasts. If any of yours gets wild, do the same as you have seen. So the man did not slaughter the camel. He hunted it down. So if I have a sheep in my barn and I take my six gauge shotgun and I shoot it and it dies. Can I eat it? The answer is no, because this is to be slaughtered, not to be hunted down. But if, for example, I unfortunately get a cow falling into a well or into a ditch, and we cannot get it over, uh, out of there. And definitely we cannot slaughter it. In this case, we say Bismillah and we try to cut it into pieces and take it. And this would become halal because we are killing it in this way so that we can take its body out of the well and at the same time not waste the meat. So it has the same ruling of this wild camel that ran away and became on steroids, attacking and uh, hitting others. So conditions for proper slaughtering. I think we will we'll stop here, inshallah. And uh, and try to finish the rest next week which is monday and we will take as many questions as we can uh, we have very little questions or very few maybe 10 so hopefully the admins would send us for next week yani much much more so that we may divide the extra class um, which was supposed to be de dedicated for questions, maybe we divide it into half after the session and half after the second session. Um, Zaid says, why an adulterer who was previously married is stoned to death? So maybe what Zaid is saying is, 
I understand that if a person is married and he commits adultery, that he should be stoned to death. I understand this. But if a person is a widow or he's divorced, why would he be stoned to death? Why not being flogged a hundred lashes like any fornicator? Because he doesn't have a wife. So sort of he is trying to find justification or legitimacy or, or an excuse, excuse for this adulterer. Well, Akhi Zaid, this ruling is from Allah Azza wa Jal. And it may not sound logical to you, but also it did not sound logical to Satan, to Iblis, when Allah ordered him to prostrate to Adam. Logically, I am better than Adam. You created me from fire and created him from clay. And we, we know what happened to him afterwards because of his logic. So I understand where you're coming from. You may say to yourself, okay, Sheikh, a man who has never ever got married in his life, yet he is an international playboy. He fornicates with all women he meets. If he's caught red-handed, what to do? The answer is flog him 100 lashes. Okay. What about if a person married a woman and he stayed with her only for one night, consummated the marriage, and then she died? or she sought divorce and they got separated. The man stayed 10 years without any sexual interaction. And then he fell into sin and had intercourse with a woman and was caught red handed or confessed. What should we do with him? stone him to death so your question is is it fair an international playboy who had sexual encounter with thousands of women and only being flogged a hundred lashes while well, this poor man only had a single night with a wife who either died or separated from him and after 10 years he fell into haram relationship and was caught. We execute him? The answer is yes. Some scholars say that the difference is that a person who was not married, all of his sexual encounters did not fulfill the emptiness in his soul. And it was all relationships that had no legitimacy. While a person who got married in a halal way and had intercourse with his halal wife, he tasted the meaning of marriage. And hence, opting for haram like the one he did is a major sin that can only be cleansed by execution this may sound logical and it may not either way this is the sharia law that has to be followed isa says can you help me with this question one of my friends said it uh, is allowed in other schools of thought for a woman okay who married who got married previously and wants to remarry, she does not need a guardian because according to the Prophet ﷺ, it's not valid without a guardian. Please help. So his question, Isa, is basically about some schools of thought that state that a divorced woman does not require the consent and approval of her guardian because she's not a virgin anymore and she's entitled for her own opinion and life. And this is 
not true. The hadith is crystal clear. لا نكاح إلا بولي. This is what the Prophet says. There is no guardian. There is no marriage valid without a guardian. And he did not mention whether she is a teenager or over seventy. The Prophet did not mention whether she is a virgin or been married multiple times or a widow, etc. So what these schools of thought or school of thought, thought say is not uh, um, true. Najiba says, <clears throat> does lipstick invalidate your ablution while not properly removed? So applying lipsticks after being in the state of ablution has no impact on your wudu. A woman performs ablution, applies lipstick, makeup, and goes to pray, no problem. The problem is when you want to perform ablution and you remove your makeup, but the lipstick is waterproof and was not removed entirely, or the foundation or the makeup you had is waterproof. In this case, your ablution, your wudu is not valid because the water is unable to reach the area underneath. Naila Mahmoud says, my question is, on the day of Qiyamah, all women will be called by their father's name or by their mother's name? No. Men and women will be called on the day of judgment by their father's name. A person is called by his mother name usually is when he's born out of wedlock. I say usually. Sometimes a person may be praised by being called after his mother because his mother is more famous, more important, more honorable than his father. Ammar ibn Yasir, his mother was Sumayya. The Prophet said, وَيْحُبْنُ Sumayya." So Sumayya was known to be the first martyr woman in Islam. The Prophet said, uh, uh, learn the Quran from Ibn Umm Abd. This is his nickname, the son of the mother of Abdullah. So we, we, we just mentioned his, his name, Abd. But this is a form of nicknaming him. So on the day of judgment, men and women will be called after their fathers, not their mothers. Okay, this is Zahra. And she says, my friend asks if the marriage was valid while she was pregnant. The answer is no. Any woman who gets married while being pregnant, her contract is void and not valid according to the vast majority of scholars. Shirin says, I've, I've deposited some money in Islamic Sharia Bank. They give me profit after every three months. So my question is, am I allowed to use this money for my daily livelihood or pay zakat with that money and do charity? The answer is yes. If this is a real Islamic bank with a Sharia board overlooking and governing its transaction, the answer is yes, you can use that, inshallah. Zinat. Bao Okizinat okay, says, can a person in his lifetime give his whole property uh, fi sabilillah? The answer is yes. I'm alive and I have my wealth in front of me, a million dollars. I've got children, I've got my wife, I've got my family, and I decide to give the whole million dollars to charity to Islamic satellite channels that propagate Islam, to building masjids, orphanages, wells where people drink water from. The, my entire wealth, this is permissible because I'm still alive and earning 
Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, gave all of his wealth three times in his lifetime to the Prophet Omar gave half of it. But is it the best scenario? The answer is not necessarily. If this would introduce hardship to your family and make them needy to people, in this case, no, this is not a good thing to do. And there's a difference between giving it during your lifetime and writing a will to be executed after your death. Such a will is invalid because you are only entitled to give one third of your wealth and not more than that. Zaid says, I'm asking about how one should cope with the innovation. Someone who interprets Allah's book and Sunnah of the Prophet with enough little knowledge and lack of qualification. I don't understand the question, Zaid, but if there is a person, an individual who does this with little knowledge and qualification, he should be forced by the authorities not to speak. Knowledge is like medicine. You can't have someone who's a rookie or someone who just comes and gives prescriptions and, and diagnoses illnesses and operates on people without any proper qualification. Religion is far greater than medicine because medicine deals with the human body in this life while religion deals with the human soul and its connection to the hereafter. Isa says, if a woman asks for divorce or khula, and the man accepts and pays the dowry back, meaning the woman, the wife pays it, this is khula, not divorce. During the first month waiting period, can it be revoked? And they, if they want to go back together, the answer is no. Once the money is received and the khula is granted, they cannot revoke this. They need a new marriage contract with the consent of her guardian, with a new dowry and the uh, testimony of two male witnesses. Samina says, is it permissible in our deen to position or to poison the street animals or to trap and throw them in the desert? The, the, this depends on the harm one gets from such animals. So for example, if I have a house where I raise or keep chicken and every night I get cats, wild cats coming, attacking the chicken, killing them and eating them. I tried my best to build fences, etc. It's not working. So there's the only option is to kill the cats. No problem. This is totally halal because anything that is harmful can be killed, but you try your level best not to torture the animal. So if you catch a mouse, for example, in a trap, you can't drown the, the mouse to kill it. You have to actually kill it, shoot it in the head, slaughter it, uh, uh, do something that is swift and lethal rather than torturing that animal. And finally, uh, Farzana says, someone who married at the time of not praying was superstitious, um, new minor shirk, but now he prays regularly. Is the marriage valid? As long as when he got married, he was known to be Muslim. He claimed to be Muslim. All around him knew him as a Muslim. And it was never brought up to court to prove that he was an apostate or a mushrik or a non-Muslim, this means that his marriage was valid, inshallah, and Allah Azza wa knows best. And this is all the time we have. Until we meet next time, I leave you for Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.